Let me um, let me challenge you guys to something. And everybody watching this, you should make your new minimum ten grand. Mm. Because you know what? You're gonna get it. Hey, how you doing? Hello. It's all here. Glad you guys are here. Got some good friends of mine, Chris Tweedy and Ryan Becker from San Diego, my old stomping grounds. And uh, they just got my course recently. Yeah, I did the course in August and took action for the first time sending mailers in September. So since September, which is now three, about six months, you were, but you just started getting traction in the last three or four months and done 11 deals, eight deals, and you got three more that you're closing. When are you going to be selling those again? This week. They're, they're in escrow. I mean, we have the buyers. They're like they're closing this week. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So excited to talk about this. So um, I love interviewing people that are just getting started in the business, just starting to have success because I'm telling you what these guys are doing. Um, you just mark my words. Six months from now, they're both going to be, if they wanted to, quit their jobs doing this full time because they're going to be making so much money doing it. Um, it's a great business to be in. And I want to just do this video as a podcast to welcome you guys to this whole concept of flipping vacant land and talk about how you can do it too. Uh, I'm excited, guys, because I just talked to a friend of mine in Colorado who does a lot of deals himself and he also coaches other people to do deals. And uh, he was telling me the story of this lady who's been in this program for a while, kind of timid, a little shy, didn't really believe in herself that she could do this, right? And I think a lot of people can relate to this. You're just getting started and you're like, man, you overanalyze it. You you kind of like are afraid to make a mistake. And then you're afraid to have success sometimes. Or you're like, you know, what if this actually works? What if the seller says yes to my offer? Then what am I going to do? So she was kind of in that boat and she did not have much money for direct mail. So finally, she just got sick and tired of being sick and tired and said, all right, I'm going to do something about this and went to a certain software, got a bunch of list, a huge list of people who have bought vacant land in the last three months in this particular county and found people that own a bunch of land already. So it wasn't just their first vacant lot that they bought. She went through and just called them all and said, hey, um, are you looking to buy more land? And they would say yes or no, whatever. She talked to, I don't know, a dozen and found 12, 10 people that said, yeah, we want to buy more land. This is what we're looking for. And this is what we'll pay for it. And then you know what she did? She went on the MLS, Redfin, and started looking for properties that had been listed for longer than six months and just started calling the realtors and saying, because she knew her buyers would pay, you know, I don't know, 10,000, uh, you know, an acre or whatever it is. And then she would just call the realtors and say, hey, I... I'm interested in buying your property. Would you sell it for this? I know it's been on the market for $50,000. You think your client might sell it for $20,000? You're thinking, what? Who would ever do that? Well, anyway, here's the cool, to make a short story long. Um, this lady's now doing a deal every three days just by doing that. Okay. Just getting on the phone, calling buyers, getting on the phone, calling realtors because she can't afford direct mail doing a deal every three days. I'm just like, dang, I love this business because there I, I've done I've done I've I've done a lot of different strategies and I've not found anything yet in real estate investing that's as easy. So uh who wants to go first? Tell us a little bit about who you guys are, how you became friends. You go to a cool church. Talk about the church you go to in San Diego because maybe there's somebody listening to this that would want to go and hang out with you guys. Yeah, I go with Chris. Sure, I'll get started because um, I I am the one who you know took your course and and started this business. Um, yeah, Ryan and I are actually next door neighbors. Literally, we share a wall in an apartment building. <laughs> um, but we met we met at church, and you know that's why Ryan decided to be my neighbor because um, our our unit opened <laughs> up. <laughs> cool. And um, yeah, we go to a church called Barabbas Road Church. It's in Kearney Mesa. For anybody in San Diego, it's um, great church. Be, we've been there I think ten years now. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we love it. But um, yeah, I I bought the course in August, and I just a little background on me. I'm, I'm I've done a ton of things. I've I've been in sales for the majority of my career, but I was a music major um, in college with music composition. So I at one point I thought I wanted to write music for movies, but uh, that didn't pan out. But um, I've always kind of had the gift of gab, and so I I naturally just found a role in sales. Um, but 
throughout the years, I've always been fascinated by real estate and I've, I've been a serial course taker up until professional student. Yeah. A professional <laughs> student. Years ago, I learned about wholesaling and got super excited about it. And, you know, was planning to, you know, uh, put out bandit signs and, you know, just tackle it, but I just never took action. I just, I was one of those people that just never took action. Um, and I came to this point in my life, I've got two kids now and I, um, I'm just not able to really get ahead in my, my full-time job. Um, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to work from home. Like I, I love my full-time job. I'm just, I just can't get ahead and, and save enough to like get a, a house for my family. So anyway, I, I saw, um, your course and it really just intrigued me. And after the, you know, the, the, the video before you purchased the course, I, I decided to go for it and I just decided before, hey, like, I'm just going to do whatever this guy says to a T. And, you know, I've got a little money saved up and I'm just, I'm just going to go for it. So I, I did, I started and I just, I also decided I was just going to take action whether or not I had everything in place. Mm. Um, that's, that, that's, that's a writer down and write that one. Down. That'll preach. <laughs> Cause that paralyzed me in the past yes. with things like this. Um, so I, I knew that I, I was going to get freedom soft and I knew that I was going to get, um, priced and get the list. I knew I was going to start mailing. That's about as far as I got. And I just started to mail, started to do the 500 letters a week. I chose a County, um, that is around where my parents live in, in central California. Um, I started sending offers just based on the priced, um, the priced recommended, okay. um, price, uh, and they were all 25%. Um, and some of these, some of these, uh, lots were in the higher value range, like in the, you know, 75 to hundred thousand so that 25 percent offer really offended a lot of people um but regardless there were a lot also lower value ones and i started to get some of these offers accepted and i i was just i was getting excited about it but i think my friends have heard me get excited about stuff before so i was kind of keeping it to myself (laughs) but um i was out in the courtyard on the phone um with a seller that i i got a property under contract oh this is actually Sorry, I feel like I'm rambling, but no, this is good. Keep keep going. Okay, okay. I also you posted that video. Perfect timing for me about uh, Freedom Land Capital, um, and that they would fund larger deals as long as you got it under contract for fifty percent. So I had this guy um, that was going to sign for you know about fifty percent of um, a much much higher value uh, deal. It's this nice old guy named Willie, and I was out in the courtyard on the phone, and Ryan overheard and. Um, I, I was super excited about it. I just told him everything and told him that I was planning to use Freedom Land Capital and, you know, and, and Ryan was like, well, I mean, you could like, why don't you just figure out a way to do it without them? I'm like, that's a good idea. Let's talk, you know? And Ryan is a a licensed realtor here in, in California. So he's done residential real estate on just on the realtor side. Um, but, but yeah, I just started chatting up with him and he was just basically like, it sounds really fun. What what you're doing just sounds fun. I'd love like if you want any help, like I'd love to do this with you. And I just I just decided, you know, let's just go into it together. Yeah. Fifty fifty. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll split expenses. We'll we'll get ahead. And, you know, I was I was actually running out of marketing my marketing budget right around the time Ryan overheard me. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now I think <laughs> no, and and then from there, um, yeah, we as we started to get properties under contract, um, we were kind of, um, strategizing different things that we could do, but we ended up deciding on, um, just listing the properties ourselves on the MLS using, um, brokerless and, um, brokerless.com broker. broker. Now, broker. What states were you doing these in? Just California. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And we've stayed in California so far. Nice. Now, why broker list? Why didn't you just list them yourself, Ryan? Or were they outside of your MLS? Um, yeah, so definitely outside of my MLS. And I um, I didn't want to get my, I didn't want to use my license and tie up my whole thing and have my broker involved in all this. So paying a hundred bucks, which is what we pay, paying a hundred bucks or two or 300 bucks through broker list, I can completely remove that liability off of myself and my license and put it on whoever else that is. Yeah. 
and then I can still do my residential and it doesn't mess up my statistics either. Either if we listen to a thousand dollar property, it will mess up your volume. Yeah. It'll mess up my, like my like price per deal. Whereas like as a realtor in San Diego, it's like my average could be, you know, whatever, 700, 800,000. If I start throwing $10,000 deals in there, it's gonna, you know, not only put liability, but lower my, you know, my average as well. All right. So let me ask you that. Were you closing on these deals, buying them, owning them, and then listing them and selling them? Um, no, we've actually only done that one time. We've, okay. we've only, and we used, um, a friend of ours funds to do it. We okay. paid him some, you know, percentage of the profits on the deal. Um, the other seven now deals, and we've got three coming this week. We have gotten the property under contract, gotten permission to list it and sell it. And we found a buyer that was willing to pay, you know, more, more than we have it under contract for. And then we just did an assignment. Um, and yeah, in most cases we haven't even had to share the closing cost with the buyer. So we've just made whatever the difference between the contract, um, price and the, uh, buy buyer price. That's, that's been our spread. Basically you're sending out mail. Hey, if you want to sell your lot, call us. Uh, they leave a voicemail, right? Yep. Do you call them back or do you just send them an offer and then talk to them after you send them offer? As you probably know, it depends. I mean, it okay. depends on the voicemail and, um, sometimes they're, you know, they'll actually send a, a price in their text or whatever. And it's just way, way sure. more than, you know, is reasonable. But so yeah, if sometimes the text works perfectly, like we've, we've done, I think three deals where we didn't even talk to the person, like until it was time for them for escrow to get involved. It was just text, which is awesome. Um, but I mean, if they want to talk on the phone, I definitely talk to them. I actually really like that part of the business. It's better, um, right? Yeah. It's always better when you can talk to them. Um, yeah. But then you send an offer. Have you tracked your numbers to see like what, how many offers does it take to get one accepted? Yes, we are at exactly one out of 20 right now. One out of 20. That's amazing. I'm averaging about the same. I tell people, let's be conservative. One out of 30, it's just a numbers game, right? You just yeah. got to make offers. All right. So then um, you've got this contract now to buy this property at 25 to 35 cents on the dollar. And uh, a lot of people think, man, I, I talked to a realtor and they said, you can't list, you can't sell that property on the MLS. It's illegal. It's immoral. And it's fattening. And uh, you're going to go to jail. Um, and you're going to go to H-E double hockey sticks if you do that. As I've heard that for years and years, but here you are in California. Now I've used brokerlist.com also in Siskiyou County, way up North California. And I found a flat fee broker that listed my properties before I actually owned it. And, uh, they listed it on the MLS and that's how we sold it. And then we, the way I did it is we double closed. So we bought the deal, then we turned around and sold it. Um, but. So you guys found a realtor, a flat fee agent that listed the property on the MLS before you owned it. Mm -hmm. Just so I'm clear. Yep. So it can be done. You need a notarized power of attorney. You need a notarized power of attorney. So explain that just briefly what that is. Yeah. So basically our contract states, it allows us, it gives us the right to purchase this property. One of the items on the contract also allows us to market this property. But just having a docu sign yeah. saying that from the seller saying that we have the right to market this property is not enough in the state of California. Yeah. We need to hire a notary, which costs seventy five dollars to, and we have a network. We have our notary who has a network of hundreds of thousands of notaries in yeah. the United States to go to that person's house and physically get a power of attorney signed yeah. that says we have the right to market that property. Yeah. We can then. With that POA, notarized POA, we can do whatever we want. That person gave us full permission to do whatever we want with that property. We take that notarized POA as well as the signed contract to our flat fee broker. And he they they look at it and they take that as gold. And they say, you can do whatever you want with this property. You can change the it. price. You can update the whatever. The seller is not involved in any of the negotiations. We do everything from there. Yeah. See, this, this is why I love working with realtors and, and working with creative real estate friendly uh, realtors um, because there's a way to do it. Mo I mean, California is one of the toughest states to do business in, period. You know, they call it the left coast for a reason. 
But even, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm from there. I can make fun of people in California. <laughs> oh, yeah. So are we. Go for it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, yeah. Um, but even in an anti business environment like California, you can still find creative ways to do these deals. And there's a huge demand for vacant land in California. Even though some would say, man, it's so competitive in California, here you guys are doing deals there, right? Mm hmm. No. Yeah. Yeah. We, we haven't known any different. Um, I, nobody told us that we shouldn't be in California. Um, I, I just saw a, a post on the, the Simple Amphlets Facebook group and as someone who's asking for advice on a, choosing a market and somebody wrote in the comments, don't choose Texas or California. So, <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I said before, don't choose Texas only for one simple reason. It's a non-disclosure state and it's hard to get yeah. sold comps, right? Yeah. But yeah. if you have access to get sold comps in Texas, um, you can kill it there because there's tons of demand, very little competition. Uh, but like California, I've done deals in Kern County and Siskiyou County, maybe San Bernardino. I'd have to go look. Maybe L.A. County. Um, but okay, let, let me ask you then something. You you guys are in California. You don't have to give me the markets you're in. Um, but are you like, are you sell? Are you buying and flipping the little, you know, five thousand dollar acre lots that you find in? you know, in, in San Bernardino County or Kern County, like those little small, they're all the same, or are you doing bigger deals than that? What do you, what do you guys mainly focus on? That, that is exactly where we started. Okay. It was the, the small ones, because that's all I knew from the yeah. course, you know, and yeah. I just did exactly what I was told to do. And we, I mean, we, we had like, I think four or five deals in that, in that range. Okay. Um, so far, but we figured out something. Um, in doing it this way, our cost to sell the property, to flip this property is the same regardless of the value of yeah. the property. Right. So we can offer more and, um, and still have a pretty decent spread if, with a more valuable property. I think that the challenge is the more valuable the property, the harder it is to get that seller to agree to what we're doing. Um, but yeah, and that, that's really the secret sauce. I think with, with this, like I've. I've become just really, you know, if they want to know what, what type of business we're doing, I, I'm just, I just tell them, you know, cause I have to get them to sign a power of attorney at the end. Anyway, I might as well be honest with them. Otherwise they're going to get that power of attorney. Like, what is this? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you could make yeah. that, you could make that part of the contract too. Right. I mean, it doesn't have to be a separate thing. You could just say, Hey, you know, we, why don't we just have our notary come over to your house, wherever you are, you could meet them at a Starbucks or something. And they'll give you some paperwork to sign. And mm -hmm. it's just part of the contract that they sign, maybe. The only reason we don't do that is because with the e-sign, you can get them to sign it like right now. Like Chris can hop off the phone with them and get them to sign it. And then the we between the time when Chris hops off the phone with them and the notary gets there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Change their mind. That's, that's, that's the only point. reason we do that. That's a good it, point. Yeah, that's the way. I mean, it's only, it's been the last three or four that we've, I think we kind of skirted behind me at, at first okay. um, until the broker um, told us we need to start getting that POA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah our okay. flat fee broker didn't, uh, didn't, wasn't abiding by the rules and was allowing us to post these in the beginning without the POA. And then he got busted. And so we had to add this to our process. Good, 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 good. We didn't know. So what, what type of properties are you chasing now? You're not chasing those little ones that, because again, yeah. if, if you're going to sell it, for, if you're going to have to sell it for five grand, you have no, you don't have much room to make any money on those, right? Yeah. So we're targeting higher value ones now because again, with this assignment process, we don't need to have, we don't need to use freedom land capital or use anyone to front that money. And so we can make offers on properties that are extremely high value, that money that we don't even have. And then like Chris was getting into a little bit, we can trim our margins because if you're looking now in the multi hundred thousand dollar range. You know, if it's a property is valued at 150, we can make an offer at a hundred thousand yeah, dollars yeah. and then we can sell it. So we usually, I think what we start at Chris, I think is around like if we make our offers at around, we have a sliding scale depending on how valuable a property is, yeah. but the higher value ones, we started around 50%. So 150 retail property might write the offer for a 90, a hundred thousand dollars. And then we sell it for a, usually around like 90% of the retail value. Yeah. So we can turn them over quickly. Yeah. And so you might sell it for one forty, but that's a forty thousand dollars spread. 
and we how much time do you give yourselves to buy the property how many months do you have for due diligence and that kind of thing same any yeah 90 days 90 days so plus plus 30 days which if we just tell them we want an extra 30 days we get an extra 30 days all right cool and uh are you doing any earnest money deposits or proof of funds for these deals on these contracts we haven't had to do that yet no I'm this last one i did a i did a pof on it because it was our biggest spread to date okay can we talk like numbers is that fun or yeah yeah totally okay so it was one that chris got under contract for eight thousand dollars um we got the we hired a professional photographer to go out there he took photos it was right after it rained in this area like non-stop for like a oh, week and it took this place that was normally just like a dust bowl desert and it just looked like a well, it just looked like a English Premier League soccer field. It was just wow. like beautiful. And we weren't like trying to, you know, we're just, we didn't coordinate it that way. It just happened, listed it. Um, we got, we have the buyers calling into Freedom Soft too. Um, got, and we figured out a way to get a little bit of a bidding war going for these okay. properties. Um, I said, hey, because we listed it so low, I said, hey, just kind of in residential real estate, have all your offers in by Thursday night at midnight. We're going to submit counter offers, whatever. Um, offers were coming in again, 8,000 was our in price offers were coming in at like 19, 20,000, then 23, then 25. And we ended up getting another contract for 28,000. Um, and that one, I, um, because we had so many buyers that were on the hook, I asked for a PO, a proof of funds. So you asked for a proof of funds though, on your buyers. I'm just saying, were the sellers ever asking you for proof of funds ah, or earnest money deposits? Not yet. But I'm not still yet. glad you told that story. Yeah. That is okay. Cool. We ask for those on the buyer side, but they don't right. ask on the sellers. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Now you, so this is a deal you're, you, you're buying, you have under contract to buy for $8,000. You found a buyer on the MLS through some kind of bidding thing, which is super cool. Um, somebody that would buy it for 28 grand, um, which is still probably a pretty good deal, right? For them. Oh yeah. It's the retail value of this thing is probably like 30, 35. Yeah. So they're getting a deal. Right. Everyone's getting a deal. <laughs> Um, so uh, this particular deal here, are you, um, you have about a $20,000 spread. Are you going to do an assignment with that as well? Or are you going to double close? Them? It's an assignment. Yeah. So we're okay. about 150 bucks for photos and another hundred bucks to list it on the MLS. So we're about like 250 bucks in on that one. This is so awesome. We're doing two assignments right now because of you, Chris, I, we talked about it and, uh, we had a buyer of one of our deals in Florida and, um, and I've never done an assignment for vacant land before. We're buying this thing for similar numbers as yours. Um, right around, I want to try to remember, 12 grand and we're selling it for 35 or something. Um, but he's paying us on two deals. Twenty. We have a $24,000 assignment fee on each of them. Um, it's like, and I was, I mean, here I am, the guy who's done a ton of deals, who teaches people how to do a ton of deals. And I'm like nervous. Oh, I'm scared. I'm what, what, what's going to happen when I tell this buyer that he has to do a, uh, an assignment fee. And I asked him, and I'm curious to know what your conversation is when you talk to these buyers. Well, I told my buyer, I said, listen, um, you're getting this thing for 35, whatever it was. I said, um, how serious are you about this? Do you really want it? And he says, yes. I said, is this 35 grand a good price? He said, yes. I said, all right, this is the way we're going to do it. This is going to save you a bunch of money in closing costs. Okay. Yep. That's how we say it too. Yeah. Yep. We're, we're, you're going to do an assignment. We're going to do one closing. We're going to do an assignment. We have it under contract to buy it. Um, I don't remember if we told them whatever, but we told them the assignment fee is going to be $24,000. Are you okay with that? Want to make sure you are, because if you're not, that's fine. We've got other people that are interested in this property. We'll call them, but are, what, is that okay with you? Not a problem. No, okay. No big deal. And, Bam. Okay. So people will actually pay you $20,000 assignment fees for these deals, knowing that they're buying it for 28, which means, oh, they bought it for eight and they're okay with that. Yeah. That's definitely something to note at the close of escrow. Everyone gets disclosed all this information anyway. So you're better off letting them know. And Chris is, and I've always been on the same page with transparency. Yeah. You're better off letting them know very, very soon, <laughs> that yeah. as early as you can, what's going to go down because they're going to find out and you'd I'd be the, rather be the one to tell them than them to find out and then them come back and get mad. That is, that's beautiful. And you're saving, 
geez, at least a couple thousand dollars, aren't you, in closing costs and escrow fees and things like that? Yep. Yep, exactly. And and we frame it just like you do, Joe, for the end buyer is, hey, you're you're saving money. You don't have to do a double closing. You don't have to pay the additional closing costs, whatever. And hey, this is how we we could go and buy this for 8,000 and sell it for 28. And then we would have to pay extra. We'd have to mark up the property. We'd have to do all this. This is just efficiency. We're just doing this in one transaction. So there's no reason why you should get upset that we have these relationships that we spend a ton of money on building these relationships with the sellers. That's that's our whole business. So there's no reason you should get mad about that. You, you're getting a deal with a 28 grand as the end price and everyone should be happy. And if you're not, then we'll find somebody else. <laughs> So the way you guys do your closings, does the seller also have to sign some kind of disclosure on this as well? Like a disclosure, like so it says, all? yeah. Does does the seller have to sign um, any kind of disclosure on how much the end your end buyer is buying it for? No, no. Nope. Okay, the seller doesn't. The seller through title and escrow. I don't believe the seller ever knows. The only way the seller would know is if they went and checked the public records or right. Zillow or whatever and saw that the ending transaction was but actually i think technically they wouldn't know because the technical ending transaction value is the eight thousand not the twenty eight thousand yeah so it it messes up comps for everyone in the area oh that's true because the closing value of the property for this one for example is eight thousand dollars that's right so the twenty eight thousand the, the twenty thousand is the assignment fee <laughs> that's right so the end the seller never knows i don't think and they don't need to know. All right. So here knows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. So talk about like some people are, I've heard this a lot. Some people are like, oh, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. um, that's not fair to the seller. And some, sometimes realtors have heartburn with this. They're like, you know what? You, you shouldn't have, well, they'll accuse us of lying to the sellers and telling them that their property is worth less than it is just so we can steal it from under them. Would you address that? Ryan um, and Chris too, obviously, but like, talk about that. Have you guys wrestled with that? Have you, what do you do to make sure like this isn't really the truth? Yeah, yeah. God, Chris deals yeah. with all the sellers. So he does a great job of setting expectations with sellers. So yeah, um, I mean, I I usually, we, we've kind of increased our introductory offer because we're not at, we're not dealing with $5,000 properties anymore. So like Ryan said, we're usually starting around 35% of, of market value. And, um, I'll just see what they say. Sometimes even before I can get there, they have a price in mind. Um, and if I can get them on the phone, I always make them say that, or I try to make them say that first. Um, so that I, I know either I've got a great deal on my hands already and I can just, you know, um, either accept it or negotiate a little bit. Um, but if they ask me questions or, or if we're just like really having a hard time agreeing on value, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell them. I you may not you may not uh, agree with this, Joe, or others watching, but I'll tell them. Listen, we've run comps on this, and here's the retail value that we we think we can get for it. And th that's our whole business. Like we're going to sell it for retail, and we're trying to get it for a little bit less than that. Yeah. Um. So well, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Huh. Okay. <laughs> no, of course you're telling the seller what you're doing. I'll even yeah. tell sellers, listen, I am not going to pay you the most for your property. You should list it with a realtor. If you really want to get the most for this property, the highest price possible, I, I'm not your guy. You should list it with an agent. And in fact, I'll give you a name. I'll give you three or four realtors that do a lot of land here if you want to list it with them. Almost every time I say that, they're like, no, I just want to get rid of it. Just, just take yeah. it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I I mean, I find myself giving advice to, to sellers that have an unrealistic expectation for what they can get for it. Um, I don't have to do that, but I... And they may not listen to me, but I, I said, listen, we do this all the time. This is what we think we can sell it for. And we're just you're way off. So, I mean, you could yeah. try to get that price listing with a realtor, but, um, this, yeah. we can just, we've been, we've been sent comp reports in some, some guesses just to, to prove it to them. So um, basically, you know, in exchange for the speed and in exchange for your price, you're giving the seller the speed and convenience of selling it quickly, getting an all cash offer. Uh, no hassles, none of that. Um, cool. And we do negotiate up because we, because we have a pretty good handle on what we what we can sell it for. We're right, and because our cost is the same, you know, we we can negotiate up as long as we're making at least five grand. We'll do the deal. 
Is, okay. Because, I mean, it's five grand we didn't have before. Yeah. You know? So is that your minimum, sh- what you're shooting for, 5K on your deals? Yeah. Like minimum. Yeah. Yeah, minimum. Let me um, let me challenge you guys with something. And everybody watching this. You should make your new minimum 10 grand. Mm. Because you know what? You're going to get it. It's like um, I have so many stories of students that I helped with this that were, man, just getting started there, happened to make three grand on a deal. Like, Joe, three grand, that's a lot of money. You don't have to work 50 hours at Home Depot to make five to make three grand. I said, well, now, now try to get five grand. Just expect minimum five grand. Start asking for it. And they do, and then they start getting it. Okay, now start asking for 7,500. Now start asking for 10 grand. And you'll be shocked. When you start just expecting it, and that's not some magic woo-woo stuff. It's just like you you will figure it out in your offers. This is what, you know, we we want to make a minimum of 10 grand. You'll start finding, you'll start doing some deals that are only maybe you make eight grand or not, but most of your deals are going to be 10 grand, 15 grand and higher, 20 grand. I would challenge you guys to change yeah. your mindset about that. For sure. I love that. Especially in California. I mean, you, your, your well, minimum profit on these deals should be 10 K. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, with that being said, like we have three under contract right now that the spread is at least 30 K based on our, our comps. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we're really starting to get more of these under contract that are higher value because we still were slogging through some of the, the lower value ones. The, the, uh, one of the first ones we ever did on assignment was I, they signed the deal at $575 and we flipped it for 3250, um, but I was I was I was amazed that um, I got a contract back for five hundred seventy five. That was back when I was just twenty five percent firing off offers. What if you sold that on owner financing? You bought it for five hundred seventy five bucks and you sold it for, you know, a hundred bucks a month for five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we definitely could have done that. We just haven't, you know, we haven't done the seller. We haven't really bought property yet, except for once, um, and we just flipped it for cash. That's so good for you guys. I think it's- <laughs> yeah. And that's start- definitely that's definitely part of our our long term strategy. Yeah, We've just been getting the nice big chunks, um, yeah. for, for now. But yeah, we definitely want to, um, have a, a segment of our business where we're we have ca- regular cash flow coming in. Yeah. Um, but we're also trying to set up our business where, you know, we can kind of predict the amount of deals we're going to get based on the amount of letters we're sending out. Like we recently upped our marketing from five hundred to a thousand. We brought on a VA. We've got a couple people interested in helping us with um, sales, um, so we're, yeah, we're we're gonna, you know, event probably pretty soon. Look at doubling our marketing again, and just seeing, you know, what what kind of results we can get. You guys need to look at doing some cold calling as well. We're doing cold calling right now. Um, and by the way, anybody watching this or listening to it, um, Gavin and I did a implementation workshop two weeks, a week or two weeks ago here in St. Louis. Um, but Gavin is my coaching business partner. He's, he's been doing houses with me for a long, long time. And his big sh- thing has been cold calling. And realtors, we learned this from you guys. Investors learned cold calling because you, you guys have been doing it forever. And um, so we, for a long time, we've been cold calling for houses. Hey, do you want to sell your house? We get one VA. We get VAs from the Philippines. And in a day's worth of cold calling, five hours, they'll get one or two leads on average. All right with houses. We've been doing this now for um, a month with vacant land in some very competitive counties. One VA is getting six to seven leads now. So they're going from one or two on a really good day to six or seven cold wow. home. Very competitive market. And a, and a lead for us is anybody who says, yeah, that's me. I own that land. I'll sell it. So something to think about. I would say as you start doing this direct mail, um, and there's, there, I, I can't say it now, but in the course, there's a company I recommend that can do cold calling and texting for you. I would, would, I would stay away from the texting. It can do some cold calling for you. You can eventually hire your own VAs to do it for you as well. But uh, a lot of opportunity there and nobody's doing it yet with vacant land. Now, follow-up question for you, Joe. Do you, do you call the same list that you're mailing? Yeah. Or is it a different, okay. Yeah. Skip trace it. Just skip trace it. Call it. I see. It's oh, it's great. working really really well, and we're going to be doing this at our next implementation workshop, um, where we're just going to be. It's like we we did it for two reasons. I wanted to get some more leads in one of these counties that I'm in, but I also wanted to give these students a bunch of leads to work on when they came to the workshop. 
And honestly, right now I'm overwhelmed with leads. I got about 160 leads right now in my freedom soft from cold calling. And I'm like, wow, okay, now we gotta start making some offers, right? <laughs> yeah. We're sitting on at least, you take 150, we're sitting on at least five or six deals from these this little campaign wow. that we, we're only halfway through this list cold calling it. So I'm really I'm excited first. about seeing the results of this. And uh, you know, you could, if you find your honey pot, your sweet market where you're, you know, it's like, you know, what's working, what's selling, you know, what, what your buyers want, you can dive deeper in there. Maybe you, you test a market with direct mail, you find a good spot, then you go deeper with cold calling that. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I mean, we could, we could, we have 15,000 records at least right now that we could have somebody just start skip tracing and cold calling. I think Joe, when you and I talked the other day and you said, you guys need to start cold calling. I just assumed you meant I should just get on the phone and start calling all these people. I'm like, that, that doesn't sound yeah. like something I want to start doing, but you mean outsourcing the cold call. Yeah, for sure. You know, you can, um, uh, offline, I'll, I'll tell you who that company is. I recommend in the course, you know, right. um, but you can hire Filipino VAs. There's a lot of people are hiring, um, uh, Latino VAs, I guess. Um, I'm not sure what the correct term to call Hispanic, mm -hmm. Latino, Spanish speaking VAs to do cold calling for you from Colombia, um, from South American countries that have really good English and you'll pay a little more for them than you would for a Filipino VA, but they're really good quality, uh, good people, hard workers, and they can do these phone calls for you for super cheap. And, um, it's, it's been really, really good for us. It's amazing. And nobody's doing it yet. Everybody's just doing direct mail because it works. It works really well. You guys have done, you know, eight deals with it, but just take it to another level. I mean, you you guys could you guys could dominate California. There's so much opportunity there. You don't have to go to any other state if you didn't want to, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh that's great. great. I think we should definitely do that. I mean, we already have yeah. we just she needs something to do. We just give her the list is already there. We just have her start calling some of these people. We're yeah. we're gonna be adding a new module in the land course about cold calling in the next one or two weeks, hopefully. <laughs> um but there's also companies you can hire, like the one I'll send you, that can do it for you. They may not do it as good as you would do it, but it's, you know, it's it's gonna work. I got some questions for you. Um, average profits on your deals right now? Um, right now, well, eight deals divided by what twenty twenty six thousand? Yes, yeah, exactly. So because so many of them, again, we started in the lower. Um, categories, they've basically gone up with every single one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what is that? 25. So it's probably around like three or 4,000. Yeah. Average. Okay. So let's do the, you next started with deals. the small deals, but your last three or four or five deals, what's your average profit been on those? So if we count this one that, if we count the ones that are closing this week, it'd be probably closer to like, uh, 10,000. Bam. I love that. Yeah. So you're, that's going to be your new minimum target, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about our, our goal as a company, you know, um, by the end of the year, especially because like you said at the beginning, from your mouth to God's ears, by the way, um, we want to be able to full-time jobs and just do this full-time. Our goal is to have 10 deals closing a month at a minimum of 10,000 per deal. So, um, yeah, we want to figure out the marketing and, and what, you know, Man. how much we'll need to be pump into it to get to that point. But you know, that's our goal. If you guys are committed to it and uh, you're working together well, you know, sounds like you got good chemistry. Um, mm -hmm. You know, th that is, it's going to be, it's going to take work, right? It, nothing's easy. C can't guarantee it, but it, it's going to be a lot easier than you think. It's not oh. gonna be that bad. You're going to get some deals where you're making 20, right? So you don't have to do 10 deals a month. You could do f five, but, um, that is so exciting, especially as you start going into new markets. You know, um, I interviewed a guy, um, in my podcast who's doing about 50 million a year flipping vacant land. That's it. Wow. Right. Now he's working with some hedge funds that got a lot of money. So he's buying everything. Um, but there's guys doing million dollar months right now, just flipping vacant land can be done for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, Bidding wars. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the bidding wars. Can you explain that a little bit more, Ryan? Like how, how are you yeah. set? 
Yeah. So um, I learned this a lot from doing my just residential real estate side. So um, just a as a little bit of context, the agreement that we're trying to get them to to get them to sign is called an assigner agreement. It's basically the other end of the agreement that we get with the seller saying that it's assignable. Now the buyer, we're going to have them sign the assigner agreement, basically agreeing to that. So um, originally we were sending out this, you know, I would talk to a buyer or whatever on the phone and be, Hey, what's the price? Okay. 30,000. And I would type up the DocuSign and then send it over to them. And as I was thinking about it, I was like, this doesn't leave a lot of room for if you have somebody else who wants a bidding work, cause if I'm the one submitting that, then if they sign it, now it's binding to me because I'm the one who sent it. So there has to be some kind of way for in a traditional transaction, like a residential transaction where they are the ones submitting the offer to us. And so we haven't, we don't have a fully like, well, eventually we won't have a website where they can submit their offer on the website. That's the goal. You can see all the properties, submit the offer on the website. Until then, I'm just having them email me or submit their offer herbally to me. And then this is a little trick that we use in residential real estate is you want to give a timeline for when you want all your offers to be in. So if you think about it as the, as the seller, even though we're not next technically the seller, but at, we're acting as the seller, you want to hold all the cards in your hand at the same time in terms of all the offers that you get in. If you have an offer that came in and someone said, oh, one might be coming in in a couple of days. And then the person that the offer that you do have in hand is saying, well, I'm going to give you by tonight to decide. It puts you in a very tough spot because you have to choose between this bird in hand versus two in the bush. Someone might have said they're offering 10 grand more, but you have this one for whatever. And so how you get around that is you say, we're about to have a listing that comes on tomorrow. We're going to say we want all offers in hand by midnight Friday night. That way, all the offers have to come in by that time. And then you submit and you say, I'm submit your highest and best offer. And then you go back and you do one more counter to the people that are, you know, close at the top say, Hey, are you sure that's your highest and best? It never is. It never is their highest and best. They can always go up. So you go, are you sure that's your highest and best? Boom. And that's how we got this thing that went from 23 to 24, 25 up to 28. You pick so which when, buyer. Oh, go ahead. So when you put it on the MLS then, um, so that has the language on there. Do you like, can you pre-release it on the MLS saying, Hey, it's coming soon. It's going to be here. You're building some anticipation for it. You can't. Um, you can't put anything about offers in the public remarks on the MLS. You can only put that in the private remarks. Okay. So I don't say anything specific about that on the MLS. We have templated emails that we send out. Say we get an interested buyer or an agent who's interested in buying it. We have an email that we send out to that agent or to that buyer that has all of the information that we can't put in the MLS, including when we want offers submitted by, how they submit offers, GPS coordinates, all this stuff, as well as a bunch of attachment stuff that we can't put on the MLS. Can you put it in agent remarks? You can, but the listing service we have doesn't make it easy to do that. Okay. Um, so I just, if they're serious, then I'll either end up on the phone with them or you know in an email chain with them. And that's just in that templated email that I send over. So, so you can't you can't say on the MLS description um, submit you, you you can't submit offers before Friday the fifteenth. To my understanding, at least the MLS service we use, the only thing you're allowed to put in public remarks on the MLS is information about the property, physical information about the property. You can't put anything. This is my understanding. This is what they told me. I'm not super versed, but. I've tried <laughs> and they say, no, that has to go in uh, confidential remarks or agent remarks or whatever. All um, right. So like, let's say you listed on a Wednesday, mm -hmm. it goes live on the Wednesday. Mm -hmm. How, when are you, are you getting enough interest in the property um, because you're pricing it so low? Is that why? Yeah. So we price it about 90% and I usually gauge within the first day, the first 24 to 48 hours, how long I'm going to give it. And so if this last one we submitted at the $8,000 within like a few hours, I was like calling Chris, like, dude, this one's going to be crazy. Like we, we hired the photographer because we never go out to these properties. We hired the photographer, gave him an extra 50 bucks to go buy signs from Ace Hardware and put our not number on there. And I was getting, we got offers before it was even listed on the MLS. Serious. Yeah. And so I got, I was like, Chris, it's like, dude. So we listed it, I think on like Monday morning and I was, and I gave it till Thursday night. Nice. So you and, make and that decision after it's listed. 
Yeah, because we have some that have been on there for a couple, like we're ending the near of our 90 day contract. I just messed up when I did the valuation and valued it too high. And now we, you know, lowered the price and lowered the price. And now our margins, like yeah. nearly like we we're talking about, barely going to make any money. And so there's those ones, but the ones that within those first 24 hours, you're getting calls on. I, yeah, I usually give it less than a week, usually about five days. And, and that's a question some people have is what if I make a bad offer and it's been sitting and it hasn't sell sold. You can go back to the seller and renegotiate a lower price, right? Yep. Or, or we can just let the con if they don't want to negotiate a lower price, we can just let the contract expire. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I've got, that is so I've got a voicemail from from a seller that is one of the ones that it's taking a little bit longer, and um, yeah, I'm gonna have a, have to have a conversation with them potentially, you know, negotiating the sales price or just you know saying we'll part ways as friends this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. You could also. Um, I've done this before where I give the seller a list of three or four realtors that they can contact that do a lot of land that they that they can help them. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the commissions. So when a realtor brings you a buyer, what kind of commissions do you pay that realtor? 3%. That's it? Yeah. Okay. I thought, you know, with, with cheaper priced land, um, is this a California thing? Because in Florida, some other states, North Carolina I've been in, I'm I'm typically the total commissions are around ten percent, so I'm paying the buyer's agent around five percent on the lower priced properties, right? Okay. California, you're you're doing three percent, not a big deal. Yeah, but again, that's just to the buyer's agent. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's no you're not getting any kickback from that. Uh, from what? From the buyer's agent saying, "Hey, I want more than three percent." What are you doing? Well, yeah, they do, but we're like, "Hey, if your buyer's interest, we bank on the fact that our properties are desirable." And the, the, the buyer is wanting to buy that property. Okay. And so the listing agent can do some unethical practices practices and try to steer them elsewhere. But ultimately their buyer wants that property and we get flack all the time, but it's like, Hey, you don't have to go out there like, or, or, you know, you send your buyer to me and I'll, you know, you don't have to represent them. <laughs> like I'll represent them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you don't have to still, drive them to the property. Let's yeah, just... exactly. So we keep that in there and you know, the 3% and, but again, our properties are vacant, so I so my pitch to the to the buyers agents is you don't have to go out to the property yourself. Yeah. I always tell them I'm a realtor. Look, you don't have to go out to the pit property yourself. I'm going to send you this assigner agreement that your broker might require a VLPA vacant land purchase agreement for the car forms, but you don't have to do that. We can do this where you just do this assigner agreement. You give the GPS coordinates to your buyer. You send them out. I send the assigner agreement to you. You click a button and boom, there's like, you know, 1500 bucks in your bank account. So I sell it to them like that. Like, Hey, you don't have to do anything and you can make a 3% commission on this. Beautiful. Love it. Um, and okay. It's worth, worth noting that the, uh, the $20,000 spread we're about to make did not have a buyer's agent at all. Wow. Oh, um, we didn't have to pay a commission on that one. Nice. And the okay, buyer's cool. paying off the closing costs. How do you guys pick your markets? There's only, you know, 10 counties, 12 counties in California. So do you, do you go countywide or do you go down into drill, drill down into specific areas in the counties? We've been doing countywide in price so far. Um, we did, and we did Fresno County, Kern County. Kern County was the one where we, I, I did like 500 letters in Fresno County. And then I switched to Kern County um, and just did five to 10 acres. Um, I think I also limited the value like to twenty thousand um, dollars in that list as well so we're actually starting a mailer at a thousand letters a week right now with the new parameters with the higher priced uh, so the you're, in price you're saying the value is higher than twenty thousand dollars yes mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's and, interesting and that's that's one of the cool things you can only do with price which is why i love it yeah. so much is because you can say avoid these cheap ones and Priced has an estimated value on every vacant lot and it's based on comps. So you're saying only give me a list of properties that are worth over $20,000. Yeah. And th this isn't necessarily a ringing endorsement for price estimated values. Right. Um, <laughs> um, cause, but I, I've actually started to use county assessed values mm -hmm. um, at a certain um, like $10,000 $10, in county assessed value. Um, cause that pretty much guarantees in most cases that the property is worth more than that. Okay. Um, good. And you're sending neutral letters. Yep. Yeah, the, the letter, the letter that, yeah, 
you gave us in the course. It just says call or text or 24 hour recorded voicemail. Okay. Yep. Um, Freedom Soft, how's that working for you? Do you like it? I know it's not yep. perfect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it works really well. I mean, I was just like everybody when I sent out the first list or sent out the first mailers and, you know, was waiting on that first phone call. And it's like, I don't know if this worked. I just paid a bunch of money for this. But yeah, the, the, the lead, you know, the voicemail comes in and that campaign. Um, I, I come from like a sales background where you have like a Kanban view. Um, you take things through the pipeline. So part of me wishes that it, it looked a little yeah. bit more like that. But, you know, we've come up with our, our own buckets to put things in um, along are with things. Are you using statuses or, or groups? Yeah, I'm using st- statuses. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Have you have you tried the new direct mail functionality? Not yet. Not, not yet. I still have a big inventory with um, with Rocket Print. Okay. That's good. Um, You're getting great yeah. pricing with Rocket Print. Yeah. You'll get the same pricing and maybe better first class mail. With FreedomSoft, the new direct mail engine now. Yeah. Um, but I'm working on putting all my templates in there, and that should be. I'm gonna have some training videos on there. But you can send one-off letter offers to sellers, and it costs the same as if you're doing five thousand. Um, and the, the oh. follow-up that you can do now with direct mail is is really amazing. Um, awesome. When you get a deal under contract, are you using a different tool to kind of manage the sales process? Are you using FreedomSoft still for that? I mean, we supplement it with a Google Sheet that we share. Okay. Um, that like Ryan basically just uses that to like say, okay, this is what we're going to listen for, and, and if he has to make a change to it, he mark, marks it down. There's probably a way to manage that in FreedomSoft that we just don't know yet. A lot of people do that, and sometimes we do. Um, I try as much as to keep it all in one place, uh, but I know a lot of land investors that will do their acquisitions in their CRM of choice, and then might use Monday.com to sell the dispositions, selling the deals, you know, mm-hmm. um, something that can give you a little bit more flexibility and that, that's that through pipeline thing that you're talking about. there. Yeah. I use sheets. Yeah. We just have, that's because you can just have it all there. You can look, we have our stages in the pipeline. We can through sheets, put them through the pipeline at a glance, see the owner and all the notes on it and just do, 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 go through like that. Yeah. That's cool. You should still track your stats, your KPIs, like your key performance indicators in FreedomSoft, right? So when you do sell the deal, put your revenue numbers in there, market is sold. That way you can see from the lead that came in, how many, from the from the list that you downloaded, how many leads you got from that, how many leads did you send offers to, and then how much revenue did it generate? So you can see your revenue per leads. And by the way, uh, Rob Swanson is um, going to be soon updating the whole KPI dashboard. Um, oh. it's going to be pretty amazing when you, when it comes out, uh, Chris, you got my business completion challenge. I have a picture of you <laughs> holding your check, getting a refund for my course. Is that right? That is correct. And that was honestly one of the, the things at the end, you know, when, when I had my buy decision criteria, I, that helped me make that decision. Awesome. Um, and honestly, even before Ryan came on, it, it was like, I was getting towards the end of my marketing budget, but I knew that at that 25th offer that I sent out, I, I could send that all, all in and I was going to get that back and I would have at least, you know, a couple more months of marketing, um, in there. So, yeah. I, I've, to date, I've refunded over 270, $275,000 in course completion challenge. Wow. Reasons, right. Wow. My goal is to do a million. Uh, and, and, and some people think I'm crazy for doing that, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's helping people like you. Chris, who were just like, I don't know if I should do this. I'm like, ah, oh, you know what? Joe's got a great guarantee there. I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. And uh, so I get some testimonials. I get guys like you on my podcast talking about how awesome this business is. And uh, I have a business proposal for you I'm going to ask you guys about later off- offline here that maybe we can do some deals together. Um, so congratulations. That's awesome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Um, keep me updated, please, on your progress it's so cool to see you guys doing these deals and um, it just yeah. it makes me uh, super happy. Good, good. Awesome. We're, we're thrilled, yeah, for the opportunity to talk to you like this. And yeah, I think we'll we'll definitely report back. We start to implement the cold calling because, um, yeah, it sounds like that's a really good next move. Yeah, I totally think it would be. Um, all right, guys, let's wrap this up. Any final tips you want to give both of you 
uh, each of you, to somebody who's new in the business, just kind of testing their waters a little bit, what would you say to them? I mean, I'll go back to what I said for the beginning, just start taking action, just send out the mailers. Even if you like, I, I did set up freedom Softs and I did set up all that, but even if you'd have to use your personal phone, you know, for a while, just send them out, send to start getting calls. Um, that's the, that's the biggest thing is just don't sit there just start taking action. It, 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 it absolutely is a numbers game at a certain point. Like even if your numbers are, are worse than somebody else, like if you send enough offers, you are going to get one accepted. And once you got, have that, there's a number of ways you can profit from that deal. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Ryan, what about you? Um, I mean, I was just going to say, yeah, numbers game. Um, yeah. Don't get discouraged. Just keep sending them out. And if you do come across your numbers are super duper low, like take inventory be like, okay, why are my numbers so much lower or whatever? But if you're following what, you know, what you advise Joe and, um, and you're doing it like that, I mean, the numbers are just going to speak for themselves and just, just keep doing it. Awesome. Good. All right, guys, uh, stick around. Don't hang up yet. Um, thank you, Chris, Ryan. Appreciate y'all. Yep. See you guys Thanks. later. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching these videos. If you like my channel at all, please hit the subscribe button. Get the notification bell thing clicked so you can get notified when new videos come out. Really appreciate it. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Comment down below, all right? Thank you.